I wrote my first paper way back in 1994, and it was published in 1995. I wasn't the first author on it, but it was really wonderful being able to uh, have mentorship by Andrew Tarbuck and Tom Denning, who were both Belgrade psychiatrists and uh, much more senior and experienced than myself, and I learned a lot from them. And it was a, a case study on um, the um, frontal effects of herpes simplex encephalitis and the uh, frontal lobe dysfunction that occurs as a consequence of it. <coughs> if I look back and I think at the things that other people have written and what I would have liked to be involved in, clearly I think there's a number of key papers that have occurred in the past two years in the realms of genetics and imaging that I think it would have been great to have been part of. But really, the papers that were really have changed our way of thinking, I mean, if you look at the Genome Project or the uh, understanding of genes in the first instance, the really, really big papers, um, those haven't happened as, as frequently as, as one would have liked in medicine, and particularly in psychiatry. And so we're still waiting for that. So a, a great discovery, a new molecule, that's the kind of paper I'm really still waiting for. I haven't written that and I haven't seen it yet, but that's what I would really hold on to. I, as I said earlier, migrated from the UK to Australia and have been there now for about 15 years. But I think it's very easy for me to, to have done that because Australia is English speaking. Uh, but there are key differences, in, particularly in terms of psychiatry. So, for instance, um, Australia uh, is largely uh, governed by private practice, whereas in England uh, it's the National Health Service that provides care for most patients. And that's been quite a switch, both in terms of thinking and in terms of management. Prior to my uh, trip to Australia and, and, and residing there now, uh, I'd really never considered the cost of treatments, cost of management. But in Australia, that's really integral to your thinking and management in terms of what you offer. Um, I think otherwise, they're really quite similar. And um, the research flourishes in, in Australia as much as it does uh, in, in, in the UK. And mental health really has been championed very much in Australia, and perhaps more so than any other country at the moment. So both in schizophrenia and depression, the initiatives both at the national level and locally, I don't think are paralleled in many other countries. One of the other differences between Australia and uh, UK, and perhaps some commonality in this area as well, is how people are trained. Um, whereas in the UK, and my training was in the UK, I, I feel it's fairly well structured and there's good support. In Australia, the uh, training is quite diverse and very much abbreviated. So after four to five years, you can become a consultant psychiatrist. And personally, I feel there's not really enough time to have grown into that role. Furthermore, the opportunities in Australia, which are vast, uh, don't seem to be well structured once you become a consultant. So for instance, working in community psychiatry or a subspecialty like consultation liaison or pediatric psychiatry, you really left your own devices. Whereas I think there's much more support in uh, England and, and the United Kingdom as a whole for young consultants to develop into senior consultants with experience. And that may also be underpinned by the differences in private and public sector psychiatry in both countries. Well, I love psychiatry, I love being a doctor and I love seeing patients and doing research, but um, I'm actually a failed musician and a failed singer. Um, I embarked on wanting to perhaps emulate some of my uh, heroes in the Indian uh, music industry and I learnt the instruments for, for double and harmonium and would have loved to have a career in singing, but I very early on realised that you also need a very important ingredient called talent. And uh, if you don't have that in buckets and the opportunity, then you're really best sticking to medicine. So I still maintain an active interest in music, but um, I wouldn't say I'm a musician of any report. Well, I was honored to be invited to be an editor of uh, Indian Nation, and I, it's, a, it's a great journal, and I really think evidence-based is important. But my interest actually goes back to my own role uh, as an editor of Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry, which I've really enjoyed and continue to do. And prior to that, I had been an editor of Actin Neuropsychiatrica. And I think it's easy to criticise journals.
because it's also easy to criticise other people and say this is what a journal should be doing or this is what we should be providing. I think more important is to get involved. If you want to see the change, then you really need to be part of that. And so that's why I wanted to be part of this particular journal. And also then there's obviously personal relationships and I have great, great regard for the, the editor. And when Andrea asked me, I was, I was uh, almost definitely going to say yes, uh, largely because of his own personal charm. I think the journal really speaks to a broad audience and it's really trying to capture both the clinicians but also researchers and academics but most importantly the young cultivated minds that are coming up through psychiatry, the ones that are growing and understanding the environment, also changing it. So it's really trying to inform them what's happening at the cutting edge of psychiatry and there's so many frontiers to psychiatry now it's very difficult to keep abreast of what's happening in all the various subspecialties and all the different types of research. And so Indymatch provides a wonderful vehicle for that. It brings together all the good science and all the good minds who can critique that science. So someone reading this is really going to be confident that they're up to date. So if you were a stock trader, you'd want to be able to have the best source for your shares. And I think if you're an academic or wanting to be well informed about psychiatry, this is the journal to be reading. So in psychiatry, I think one of the challenges we face, and we have faced in this past 12 months and the coming 12 months, is our classification system has really been torn apart, looking at DSM-5 and up-and-coming ICD-11. There's questions as to whether psychiatry in itself is an entity, whether we understand mental uh, uh, phenomena, and we really are directionless to some extent. And that's why I think we have to gravitate back to our evidence base and not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have a good evidence, we just have to understand it better and then incorporate and translate that into clinical practice. I think this is actually an exciting time for us to reinvent ourselves and provide ourselves a much stronger foundation upon which we can build our profession. I see psychiatry flourishing in the next 25 to 50 years and I hope we're in a state where we actually have very specific uh, and effective treatments for patients and have a much, much richer understanding of the brain. I think at the same time we have to understand that we are dealing with the most complex organ in the universe. And that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of. We're not taking on something easy. So setting ourselves with targets of three years or five years or even 10 years is totally unrealistic. If we look at how long it took for man to achieve uh, understanding of other sciences, uh, we have to give ourselves a reasonable lead time. And when you're talking about the brain, then I really think 50 years or a century is a realistic goal. But I, I'm very confident that we'll have a much better foundational understanding of uh, brain science and psychiatry within that.